So we are going to, uh, you're going <clears> to, <throat> I am starting to, to mark the workshops. I'm going to go through and send you feedback on the workshops. Okay. So when you are looking at the, I'm going to clean this up first. So it's going to be something like this. Where is it? Uh, OP244. So when you're going to the 244 uh, notes, NAA and uh, uh, ZAA, there is something over here called marking. OK? In this marking thing, you're going to get comments from me coming in like this. And, and I'm going to send you this. OK? So. It's going to be a link. If you click on it, then it's going to bring you to a place, show you what did you do wrong. It's not exactly your code, but it's a similar mistake that you made. So you're going to receive these things from me. And um, so I'm going to, uh, I don't know if I'm, I may clear this up and put something at the top that is the current things that I see. But as soon as you receive a message like that, it's your responsibility to take a look at this site and see what it is. And if people are asking, okay, what is your code regulation? This is it. Just come over here right from the beginning. Just take a look at it and see what it is that uh, uh, you see over here and you're not supposed to do it. For example, exiting the function in the middle of the function, a function have must one point of entry, one point of exit, unless it's impossible to do so, which is very rare. So it means you should not have a return statement halfway through a function. Or even more than one return statement in a function. A function must have only one return statement. So that's the thing. This is how it is. This is the fix. So you will see exactly what, how the fix was done. Uh, and the next one, friend helper functions. If you see you don't understand what it is, it means you still you haven't studied it yet. Just go to the next one. But every, if you go through all these things, these are all the feedbacks that I've sent through past two, three years to students. And anything that is there, you're not supposed to do. <clears throat> so that's that. Having said that, let's start. We talked about uh, 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 student class, and we created a student class with a uh, no argument constructor, or what we call it, a default constructor. And also, we created a destructor, and we explained that uh, a constructor, by definition, is a procedure. It's not a function. It's a procedure that will be get called or will get called automatically when object comes to life. As soon as the object comes to life, automatically a constructor is called so you can clean up your uh, class. Therefore, when your class is born, you have a fresh setup class that you can use it safely. And the allocate happens, the, the destru destructor, uh, that uh, the syntax is a tilde and the name of the class will actually get call, called right before the object is about to go off scope. So right before the object is dead, you want to clean up stuff, that's what you do. You call that one. You call tilde thingy. Okay? So we went over there, so we explained all those things. We did a dynamic student over here with a name, student number. And the deallocate method went to the private part because we don't want anybody to be able to deallocate it unless us. So that's the private part. They, not, they don't have access to it. But all the, the, the properties of the function, all the methods of the function have access to that uh, private member, and therefore they can actually use it. We said <coughs> uh, for a class to actually uh, be used, you should always recognize, be able to recognize its state to see if the class you have is a valid class or it's a class that is invalid and cannot be used. We said that we do that by setting the properties. When I say properties, I mean attributes, I mean member functions, member variables, member variables, attributes, or uh, uh, properties. These are the three things. They're, they all mean the same, OK? Property, attribute, member, variables. We set the member variables to some specific impossible value, so later on we can actually recognize it. How do we do that? <clears throat> As you see over here, 
in the constructor, I'm setting the name to null and student number to zero. It is impossible for a student's pointer name to point to null because that means there is no name, there is no dynamic memory allocation, therefore that's that. To do that, it's a good thing to actually have something like set empty to actually set the class to an empty state so, so you don't so you don't have to think, what was the rule that I want to follow? I wanted to set that to minus one. You don't do that. You put it in there so when you are actually using it, you don't, uh, uh, you know it's a standard thing and it's going to get followed. So instead of actually doing that, I will put that in the function and call the function instead. And at any moment that I want to actually set it empty, I will do so. So it becomes a recognizable state for the class, and therefore, if I want to recognize it, then I will create a function called isEmpty that is going to tell me if the object is empty. I make it constant because I don't want to change anything. I just want to see what the state of the object is. And for that, all I need to do is to check <clears throat> the things I have set in the set empty. So let me just go back in here because so where is the thing? I think it's, um, there you go. That's set empty. Let me just come in. Where is, is, is empty is here. So <clears throat> it is impossible for the name to be set to nothing. So I can simply say over here um, name being equal to null PTR means it's an empty thing. Now I can recognize to see if the object is empty or not. Therefore, in my, if in my deallocate, I don't need to set m name is null PDR anymore. What I do after I delete, I'm going to say set empty. I reuse my code. Therefore, if <clears throat> the business logic of mine dictates that is an empty state is something else, I don't have to go change 50 different places. I simply go to my set empty and reset it to what it's supposed to be done. Always do that. It is extremely, extremely important. Now, question may rise that, hey, the allocate is always called at the uh, end of the lifetime of the function. Why are you setting it to empty? If that was the case, you're right. We didn't need to. But because the allocate is a function of its own, and later on we're going to learn that we might need to reallocate and set the student's name, like a student name is Fred Soleil, but he wants to be called Freddy too. Therefore, you want to say Fred, Freddy Soleil. You want to change the name. You want to modify the name. If that's the case, you have to deallocate and allocate. So not necessarily a function deallocate is guaranteed that it's going to be called at the end of the lifetime. Therefore, we have to take the precautions of dynamic memory allocation, which where any <clears throat> unused memory is set to null. Any deallocation that happens afterwards, you set the pointer for the allocation to null. When the object comes to being, the allocation, the, 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 the pointer that is unused should be set to null. This is something extremely important. Therefore, you can, if you follow that, and you can, if you always set your unused pointer to null, then if the pointer is not null, it means there is dynamic memory allocation, which means you can just delete the pointer with uh, ease of mind, making sure that the value in there is actually a legit address. It's not some garbage and I'm going to crash my, my application, my program. And many of you, when you get uh, through Valgrin, you get the message uh, compilation error when it's actually running. It says a conditional jump. Uh, uh, unconditional jump or something like that, it says, um, in your Valkyrie. Uh, I don't know exact. Uh, somebody got this message today. What was, what does it say? Conditional jump or something? Yeah. yeah, when it says something like that, it means usually you have a variable that is not assigned, and you, based on a value that is not assigned, you are doing something. So you try to do something based on the value that is not assigned to anything. Therefore, the value inside is random. Therefore, the outcome is not guaranteed. 
Therefore, that's going to be a warning. You have to go back and see what you left unsaid. Usually, that is the case. Not always, but usually. So now I added is empty over here. <clears throat> and now I have the set over here. Now, when I'm actually setting, as you see over here, um, um, the set that I'm doing with uh, two arguments. Where is it? There we go. As you see in my set, I am deallocating before I do anything. Therefore, I can reset the student over and over to whatever I want. The old data will be deleted automatically, and then uh, I can reallocate, and I'm safe. Okay? Um, <clears throat> that's, that. Um, let me uh, say, uh, there is something that I have to tell you, and I'm going to tell you, and I, if, if even 20% of you guys do this, it will be amazing, okay? Uh, always before you come to class, review the notes that we had for the last day. So it becomes a continuation of what we have, and you're going to learn things better. If you don't review the thing that I had before, I'm going to take the code and start doing something because I don't want to write every time from scratch. That's going to take a long time. I'm just taking this. If you already know how student is being shown, then, okay? For example, in this show thingy, I'm saying if, F, if name is not null, do that. That's wrong. I have to say if not is empty, do this. So I'm reusing my code. Remember what, I, what we said? If not is empty, then show the student. Otherwise, the object is invalid. <clears throat> there is something that you need to understand about the empty state of an object. The correct way of saying it is invalid empty state. Sometimes an object can be empty and completely valid. Like you are creating a container. I'm creating, I'm simulating a coffee cup. A coffee cup that doesn't have coffee inside, it's still a valid thing. It's not an invalid object. It's just an empty cup. Correct? It can be used. But an invalid empty state means, so if I want to print an empty cup of coffee, it simply is going to tell me there's no coffee in there. Or a cup. Not, let's not put it that way. So a cup. Or a container. Or something. They are still valid. But an, an invalid container is an con invalid container uh, we call it, like, put it in a safe, empty state. It means the object is not usable. You have to do something to it to become usable. So remember about that definition. They are very <clears throat> uh, close to each other, and sometimes they get mistaken. Okay? So you have to always see if my empty state is an empty state or an invalid empty state. Sometimes it's not even mentioned. It's your choice to do it so or not. So... Going through this, in a constructor, I'm setting the student to empty in a default constructor. So a student that is getting created just like that is, an invalid, is in an invalid empty state. I have to first set it to be able to use it. Okay? That's, that's the constructor that we have. And then I have <coughs> uh, a destructor over here that destroys uh, <coughs> the student by deallocating its memory. The set function with two parameters receives a name and a student number and first deallocates uh, the memory and then it resets the memory to the name that is coming in, copying the name from uh, wherever it's coming through. So, um, and, uh, and, uh, and it sets the, 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 the attributes of the, of the class. And we set every class that you create, all the attributes, uh, all the attributes of the class should start with M underline. So remember that, M underline. <clears throat> different standards, different places, like uh, many places, they, many companies and stuff, they say when you are creating an attribute, it should be with the initial of the class. So it becomes S underline name, S underline student number. Okay? In our thingy, it's all M underline. Okay, and, I, and I'm hoping that all the professors designing workshops will do the same. But if you see they changed it, don't worry, it's just a, their stuff, okay? But if it's not mentioned, do it that way. Yes? I have a question for line or concept plan. Sometimes we will not call them, they are just positions. And we <coughs> put them 
You mean the package, package, uh, as a private member? A constructor as a private member? Yeah, constructor. Okay. Uh, you are not calling the constructor. That's absolutely right. But constructor is called because you created the object. If you make the constructor private, then you cannot create the object anymore. Sometimes we need that. You will see later in the semester, we'll find out that sometimes, for example, a keyboard. You want to create an object for a keyboard. A keyboard has keys over it, correct? Can you have an individual key somewhere of a keyboard? No. A key for a keyboard only exists on a keyboard. So if I am to create two classes, a class for a keyboard and a class for key, so th my keyboard becomes an array of keys. If that's the case, then the key itself should not be able to get instantiated. You should not be able to create a key unless it is in a keyboard, correct? For that case, you make the constructor of key private and make only keyboard have access to it. You'll find out how. Therefore, only a keyboard can construct the key and no one else. For that case, your thing is valid. But for our case, at our level of knowledge, all constructors and destructors are public. If you make it private, you cannot create it anymore. No, I mean, like, just take a look at it. If I just do it like this, okay, take a look at uh, the main. Where's my student? Oh, this, is, this doesn't belong to it. What is this? Oh, this is the, okay, this is not the student main. Let me bring the student main, sorry. I thought I copied the student main. I made a, a wrong copy. So where is the student main? <coughs> Oops. There you go. Now if I do that, take a look. What does it say? I'm trying to bring it on air. So it says, Student, student, which is the default constructor, declare that yada, 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 yada is inaccessible, which means you cannot instantiate the class anymore. So constructors, for our level of knowledge, constructors and destructors are always public. We good? <clears throat> Another thing we need to learn is something Another thing that we need to learn is how can I actually make a student get initialized right at the moment of creation? Why do I have to first create a student and then call it Jack? If I don't want to get the information and I know I want Jack Smith to be the student, I want to create a student named Jack Smith. I don't want to first create a student, then set it. How do I do that? With a constructor that has only one argument, OK? Because it's only one name. Those type of things, one argument constructors are special ones. I'll tell you why. So why is it empty over here? Did I remove this? Why did I remove it? Bad boy I am. OK, so <clears throat> a one argument constructor, it is created as you know, so it's constant character pointer name. There is no problem. So it's a one argument constructor that you create. And with this one argument constructor, you do whatever you need to do. So I'm going to put over here, uh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I'm going to say um, student, student. And I'm going to put over here constant character pointer name. Now I have to set the student, right? I don't want to write another code over here, so I'm going to use the knowledge I gained at the second week or first week. That was default value for arguments. And in here, I'm going to put an equal to zero, OK? Which means if somebody actually wants to set just the student name with nothing, 
the student number will be zero by default. So I'm gonna come over here and because that's now set to zero, it means I can call the set without any, uh, uh, without any, uh, what should we call it? Uh, without any um, student numbers and only with one argument. So in here, I can actually say set <coughs> name to set the thing. There is a problem over here though. I, just, I specifically wanted to do that to tell you reusing code needs caution. When you call the set, what is the very first thing that happens in function set? Say it, don't worry. No, the, what is the very first thing that happens in function set? Pardon me? No, no, read it. The first line of function set. Deallocate, correct? So the very first thing it wants to do is to deallocate the name because set presumes there is either something in the name before or if it's not, it's null, so nothing's gonna happen. But we are in a constructor, correct? When an object is being constructed, it's not a regular function. It happens when the function is just created. Therefore, over there, there is no guarantee that the attribute name is actually null. You have to make it null before you actually call the set. Otherwise, your set is gonna crash. Why? Because student starts, it just comes to the being, right? This has garbage in it, this has garbage in it. Then you are saying, call set. Name comes over here, it wants to deallocate. And as soon as I, it wants to deallocate, what it does is delete name. You had garbage in name. That garbage is an address, someone's memory that you are trying to delete. So if you are doing that, you have to flag this thing, make sure to understand that it's, uh, tell it, uh, make sure that it's not null, so you have to actually put over here null PTR. Prepare for set function. So reusing code is not all that, all that easy. Sometimes you need to think a little, okay? to make sure that what you're doing is not gonna cause trouble. Uh, obviously, student number, I could set it to zero too. So that's one way. That's one way to, is to do that. Another way is actually to make sure everything init is initialized within your class. So if I actually do this, it means no matter how the constructor is actually called and created, these values will be empty which means I don't even need to write set empty in here anymore. You could do that. You could actually make the student attributes get initialized when the student is getting created by doing that. Well, not doing that now, just letting you know that you could do that. That's the safest way to, <clears throat> to, to initialize things. There are so many different ways there are so many different ways to initialize attributes, and I'm gonna go through them one by one so you'll see. So, the most the traditional way. That actually is something new. You couldn't do that in previous versions of C++. In previous versions of C++, it wasn't allowed to initialize member variable. You couldn't do that. This is something new. So everybody were used to that or another syntax that I'm gonna show you later. Okay, so now I have a one argument constructor with which I can actually create a student with some value in it. So now in here I can, for example, say R, and in here I can say Roger. Waters, whatever, a name, okay? So <clears throat> I'm putting some name over there. And by doing so, it's going to get created right off the bat. So, so uh, with some value in it, and I can l literally say over here, all dot r dot show, right over there with absolutely no problem, okay? So if I run the program now, you will see that. <coughs> it will be called, and as soon as I Go through it, you'll see that the first one is going to the default constructor. That's S is getting created and it sets it to empty. 
And I actually did the bad thing that I'm going to fix in a second, but we'll see. Then we come over here, and now it first set that name to null, so name is null now. Then it, it comes over here, says deallocate. No problem, because it's null. It's not going to, nothing's going to happen. Everything's good. <clears throat> it sets it to empty, comes back over here, and we have Roger Waters over here, so it's going to actually allocate memory for it, copy it, set the student number to zero, <clears throat> and then it comes out and it shows the student, so, so you will see that you have Roger Waters in number zero. Are we okay with this? All right. <clears throat> the point is, the point is that this is not the only way to call a constructor with one argument. You've been calling the one argument constructor for a long time, and you've never been aware of it. How do you call a one argument constructor? Just separate it so we understand how it works. So one is to write like this, that we just did, and the other one is this. Initialization. So, when, so for example, in here, do I have a loop anywhere? Any? I don't have anything. So if I want to set an integer to, to say 100, I can say integer i 100. It's the same thing as integer i is equal to 100. They are the same. In C++ and not in C. In C++, initialization is calling a one argument constructor. Okay? So at line 9, I am calling the one argument constructor of 100, of, of i, and set it to 100. Got it? Okay. For line one, um, it's the same. The student number will be like 0 or, or undefined? It's going to be 0, not undefined. We just wrote the code for it. We just made it 0. We just made it 0 right over here. Remember? That default argument. If we don't have it, it, uh, it will be compiler. Yeah, it, not compiler. It's going to be undefined. That's why I said this is not a good thing that I did. It was better if I actually did this. So now it's not going to be undefined. It's going to be zero. No, no. It's as I, as only one argument constructor, and that's it. Okay? Of course, we can have a two argument constructor with absolutely no problem. I could have actually a, a student that accepts a constant character pointer name and the student number. I can do that. There is no problem with this. Okay? Change their mind. That was scary, I guess. What did I do? Oh. Constructor. So what do you think? I'm not going to answer that question. Because the question is obvious. What is the sequence? It depends which one you call. How do you create your object? If you create object with no argument, no argument will be called. If you create the, the, the object with two arguments, the two argument will be called. There is no sequence. Whichever you call, that one's going to get called. Whichever you call first, that one's going to get called. <laughs> Which one I'm calling here? The one with one argument. Which one I'm calling here? The zero argument. You don't call it, but it calls the proper one for you. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, well, of course. By initializing, I'm, so I'm saying when R is created, I'm going to give it one value. What does it mean? One argument constructor. Now, in here, where is it? Oh, so I want to, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say over here, set empty. And in here, I'm going to say set name and student number, right? So I'm calling the one with two. So now, in here, I cannot do that anymore. I cannot use an assignment anymore. You follow? Assignment cannot be used anymore. So in here, if I want to say student t, a 
See, there's a person called Tiger Lion. <laughs> okay, so if I do actually do something like this, I cannot say, okay, now I'm going to put over here one, two, three, four, five. You can't do that. That's not going to work. If you want it, then you have to either go with traditional way or you have to go with the universal way, which is this one. They're all the same. Either traditional or universal. Either put parentheses and put argument one or two, or put curly bracket one or two, it's, same. it's the same. They're all the same. Now, if I actually run this over here, I'm going to say t.show. And just for you, because you're, you're not going to think that the first, that one, the second, I'm just going to put that one first. So that one's going to get. So when I actually run the program, you'll see that the very first one that's going to get called is the one that is passed by two arguments. So it comes over here. It goes to the two argument constructor. And therefore, the set with two argument will be called. Then it comes back, and it's a no argument one, which is default constructor which is default, and then it's going to go with one, which is one. So you can actually decide what you call it with. And you can overload the constructors, like maybe I want to have the, so let's say, <clears throat> let's say I want to have something like this. What if I just have a student with a student number? Can I do that? Yes. I can actually write student n, and in here put one, two, three, four, five, u. Because I want it to be unsigned, I want to make sure that we understand that. What's going on here? Capital U? Oh, because there is nothing over there. So now if I want to actually create that constructor, I have to say student, student, unsigned, and a student number. And in here, for example, I would say set, no name, and STNO. And student, I think that's yeah. good. Second the second one too? No. <laughs> stew, stew, dent. Okay, good. All right. Is it correct? So why is it giving me error? Because I didn't create the prototype for it. That's why. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> student. <laughs> Being a teacher and spelling student wrong is just a shame. <laughs> Unsigned int student number. Okay, so something's wrong with me today. Forgive me. And in here, I'm going to go set empty, make sure that everything's good. So now I can actually create a student. What's going on here? It's just late. Not found. It is there. Student. I think it's a student. Yeah, I think it's fine. So we'll go over here. Now I can actually create a student like that, and I can say over here end.show, right? So if I run the program three years later, <clears throat> as you see, that's going to be a two argument constructor. Then it's going to be no argument, and this one is actually going to go to the one that's going to be the no name thingy. And when it calls, those three things are called and no name student number one, two, three, four, five. Are we good? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, thank you. So now I could have it like this. You actually don't need to put U over here. The closest one is going to get picked. Compiler takes a look at it. OK, I have an integer. There's an unsigned integer. If that looks close enough, it will call it. But it's always good practice to just say, I know it's an unsigned. Just put it over there. But it's the same. So now if I run it, uh, that's going to happen. Are we OK with this? Are we OK down to this point? So that's all different types of constructors you can create. OK? <coughs> so. And remember, this is the same thing as this one.
So the universal way of initialize, initializing works for all of them. That works perfectly too. That is the same as, as the first one. So one argument, one argument, one argument, all the same. Just to make sure we understand it all the same. Are we good? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? All right. Next will be <clears throat> cascading effect. I'll show you something now in two seconds. Attention, please. This is my friend's cell phone, right? He doesn't know if it's here. Ask the lady, where is the cell phone? What she's going to say, in this room or in room 570? In this room, why? Because they're both in here, right? So that's what we have that one in C++. In C++, you can refer to the place you're in. You can refer to his address. And that's called this. OK? So just to show you, like it, I know it's not completely absolute banana crazy type of thing. To say in here, I have, I'm going to give you some examples. So let's say in here, for some reason, I am nuts enough to put this one M name. So I have the variable, the argument name, m name, and I have the attribute name, m name two. Got it? So this is the m name in this function, and I have an m name in this class too. How do I differentiate between the two to know which one is what? Okay, um, uh, that's not the best place to give example. Let me just put it something in here. So we are doing. I'm going to go into this here. M name. There you go. This is going to actually create lots of conflict. So you don't, if I write M name over here too, how does it know which one is the argument and which one is the classes? Correct? In here too. How does it know which one is what? Correct? If I want to tell you, hey, I'm talking about the M name of this class, I can actually say this class's name and this class as M name. Never do that, ever. Ever. It's just for example purposes here. Okay? Because you will forget this, and it becomes the worst bug you've ever had in your life. Because you look at it, and you can't see what's wrong with it. Okay? Be extremely careful. All right, so yeah, this always, so this is just, so I'm going to say never do this, never do what I did here, here with this, it is for example only. That's why we call the attributes M underline. Because I want you to put the, the, the arguments a proper name. If you name the attributes name over there, then you have to call this one NME, something to make it different, right? When I ask you to specifically add a prefix to the member variables, it makes the name different without changing the name. Got it? All right. But that's not the only thing that this can do. <clears throat> this holds the address of the current object. Obviously, in main, I cannot say this because main is not a method. What is a method? What is a method? 
a member function. Name is uh, main is not a member function. Therefore, I cannot use this in it. This can be only used in a method, in a member function, because those are the ones that belong to classes, right? <clears throat> this holds the address of the current object. If I want the reference of the current object in a method, how do I refer to it? Target of this, asterisk this, okay? Target of this. So, for example, in here, I'm saying set, right? In here, I'm going to say return. Take a look at this. I'm going to say return student reference. And at the end, I'm going to say return this. What does it mean? It means, first of all, it means that I have to change the prototype too. So I'm going to come over here. And, and in both sets, I'm, oh, this set has a Boolean. So I'm not going to touch that. In here, I'm going to say student <coughs> reference. So that's the set for a student. So I'm saying set will return the alias of the student itself. Set will retain the alias of the student itself, which means, which means, let's uh, save this over here as a uh, student main.cpp. I just want to clean it up so we don't have too much of stuff over there. So I'll go, I'm going to take everything out over here. So let that tiger line be there. So now in here, I can say t.set to Fred Soleil with student number 34567. And look what I'm going to do, dot show. You see what I did? What just happened? Let's split the window. Set is returning the reference of the current student. Set is returning the reference of the current student. What is the current student? T. So set becomes the new name of T. Therefore, you can put a dot beside it and show it. You don't have to go to next slide. Got it? Easy breezy, right? Don't go like that. It's very obvious. Right? <laughs> so let's take a look. If I run it, for the first one, it looks good. Let me just take this out. Bring it over here and bring this one over here. So, so it goes over here. We know that it's going to set it and it's going to show it, right? Then we're going to go in set in here. So first, t.set is called. So it goes in here, gets the Fred Soleil over here, and puts this Fred Soleil over the name that is null because we just deallocated it, and then sets it, so now it becomes Fred Soleil, and then student number will be set to whatever it is. Then it returns the reference of this object. Therefore, when it comes back in here, now show of that one will be called, which is the show of Fred Soleil. Got it? All right. This reference stuff, not only with this, but it's very useful. And I'll tell you why. So, <clears throat> we okay down to this point? What is C out made up of? What is the object C, what is the class C out is made up of? We talked about it, didn't we? C out is made up of so they are both in iostream header file, right? We said C out is an instance of iStream, right? C in is an, sorry, C out is an instance of O stream, output stream. C in is an instance of iStream. Remember that? Remember that? Okay. So in here, <clears throat> this show thingy that I have that is doing C out, I can do this. Take a look. I can say, O stream reference. And at the end, I can say return C out. Because C out is of type O stream, right? Let me go back in the header file and change that too. 
Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So this one becomes O stream reference. Because now I'm using O stream in the header file, I need to include it. Include IO stream. But because I'm in the header file, I am not allowed to use using. I cannot say using namespace std. Not allowed here. It doesn't give you a compiler. It's a huge logical mistake. Never use a namespace inside a header file. Because of that, I have to qualify this by putting OST std beside it. So I'm saying O streams std, it's going to return the reference of that. Now take a look. So now, the show that I have, I don't need to put new line after, which I shouldn't actually. Why? Because sometimes I want to show a student and something right after it. If you do a new line in the show, then you have no chance to show anything in front of it. It's going to go always to red. Like if you want to have a list of students shown and in a table, it's impossible. Because it's going to go to next line. You want to choose to go to next line. So I remove the and, and L over there. And now when, I'm actually, when I actually want to uh, go to new line, because show is returning O stream, I can say and L. Because now show becomes a new name for O stream, for C out. Any reference returned, any reference returned represents that thing. Because now show is returning O stream, therefore you can use it like this. Or I can say has overwritten the tiger lion thingy, whatever, okay? And then I go to new line. So now I have a chance to do so. So now when I'm actually running this, the first show, and I'm going to go at right and put this one at left. So the first show over, the first show over here is going to go in here check to see if everything's okay. It's going to show it, but it's not going to go to new line. And returns the C out back. Now in here, it's going to go to new line. And in here, I'm going to show Fred's first set it. So it's going to set. It returns the student. Now student's show will be called. Now student is going to be displayed. And then after that, instead of just going to new line, I'm going to first print the message and then go to new line. Saying, Fred Solisteriana has overwritten the tiger line thingy, whatever. You follow what just happened? So this returning references of classes, either it's the current class's reference or some other class, creates what we call it a cascading effect, which means you don't have to write things in new line over and over and over. If I didn't have that one, if I didn't have the, I had to say T set, semicolon, T dot show, semicolon, then C out, I had to write it, but now I don't need to, I just write it in one line. And each one takes over the other one, keeps going and going and going. That is called cascading effect. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with one? Are we okay with two? Are we okay? All right. Now we're going to do lots of beautiful stuff with these. Like with these, with these features of C++, you're going to create custom types and make your custom types work like an integer. As if you're dealing with an integer, you create an employee and you work with the object of employee as if you're working. Like if you want to add salaries to it, you say employee plus equal 10,000. Automatically it's going to add. So you can change everything in C++. Because it's an object-oriented language, you can overload everything. Everything can be polymorphic. A plus equal for an employee means add to its salary. A plus equal to an integer, it means add 
an integer. A plus equal for a string means concatenate two strings. So again, you can do many different things as we are going to go through all the good things we are learning. Questions? No? No questions? All right. So we don't write any uh, see our method after calling this. After it's going to stay at that line. It's not going to go. So, so if I do this, Okay, then I have to write C out over here, right? So first it's going to show, and then it's going to go to C out. But C out show was returning C out. So if we just write a new line called C out and then semicolon, it won't cause any issue. No, it won't cause any issue. It just, it just not goes to new line. It's as if you write this. Will this cause any issue? No. It, doesn't, it just doesn't do anything. It just said see out. Right? It's like, it's like you say, it's like you create integer i, and they say i. That's not a wrong thing to do, but it just doesn't do anything. Okay? It's an, something that has no use. Are we okay? Are we okay? So having said, having done this, to just demonstrate again to you how things are going to happen, I'm going to start developing something new. Okay? We're going to start developing something new. Uh, we're going to start creating a class called string. So you don't have to, to write the string header file. You can actually use that one instead. Okay? So we're going to do something like that. We're going to actually create it. All right? Uh, but, uh, and, and we're going to make it better as, as we are going forward, and we're going to teach new stuff with, so we can see actually how it, how it works. Any questions down to this point? One thing I wanted to tell you, like, for example, um, um, uh, what's the time? I can give you a break. Let's get a break and then come back, and then we'll continue. So please uh, remind me to resume recording. To me for a second about workshops. I keep getting these questions. Work, workshops are targeted to teach you something specific. So if something is not tested in the workshop and not requested, don't ask if you have to do it or not. Like, should I make sure that it's validated or not? Does it ask you? No, don't do it. Do not do anything extra in workshops. All the things that you think that you're going to do, it's going to come soon. Okay? So we are trying to target only one thing in a workshop and go with that only, please. Now. Next thing I want to tell you, how to reuse your codes from workshop to workshop to project and so on and so forth. How do we reuse our code? This is a good way of using it. It's not the, the best, like it's a better way, but this is one way that teaches you many things. Create a class called utils for your utilities. And as you see, I have these two over here at left and right. The, the usual thing, it's a module, it's utils. For example, I want to get an integer in here, okay? I want to receive an integer from the user. So I'm going to write a foolproof integer getting program in here and use it somewhere else. So how do I do that? So I want to get an integer. So how do we do that? We want to, so I'm going to write different versions depending on what I'm going to use. One of them is going to return an integer. So it, and I'm going to call it, say, get. Uh, int. I can change it later on, but for now, okay? When you get an integer, usually you want to show a prompt, correct? So in here, I'm going to say constant, constant character pointer prompt. So I'm going to show a prompt. When you get an integer, usually you want to have a limit between this and that, right? So I'm going to say int min and int max. So that's what I want to, to do in here. Okay? Are we okay with this? All right. So that's one. Immediately, I'm going to say integer value. And I'm going to say return int, return value. That's my first function. Ta-da! Second, 
I want to just get an integer. No no max, no min, nothing. Just a valid integer. How do I do that? I'm going to call it int, get int. I'm not going to pass anything to it. And in here, I'm just going to have integer value and return value. So let's, because I'm just coming, quite frankly, I'm just coming up with it right now. Because every single time I write it differently, now I'm going to do it like this. So first, let's write something that gets an integer and makes sure that the integer is a valid integer when we are getting it. How do we do that? I'm going to say over here, cn. As soon as I said cn, I'm going to go up in here. Oh, I need cn. So I'm going to come back, come up over here and say, include io stream and io stream. And I'm going to say using namespace. Pardon? Excuse me? Oh, I'm doing it in .h file? Okay, I'll take it out. Two seconds. Believe me, no sweat. There you go. So it's in utils class. And this one's going to be, let me call them. Better? What the devil happened here? Oh. My mouse is not precise. There you go. That's better. Better? Are we okay? Okay. So in here, I don't need it actually. I, you're absolutely right. I'm going to put it over there. I'm, I'm going to put it only if I need to use it. That's all. And always, uh, Library header files come first. Don't put the thing at the top, OK? So now I'm going to say cn into value. So let's first get the value. I got the value. So now I have to check if it's failed or not, because to see if the user, I asked them to enter your age, and instead of putting 2.5, they put TWNTYFIV. So I want to just make sure that that's fine. So I'm going to say if cn or not cn, it means something went wrong, right? Not seen is the same thing as seeing that fail. Potatoes, potatoes. So if it fails, first I have to say I apologize. First I'm going to say I apologize. Remember, you just asked it now. First I'm going to say I apologize. Then I'm going to say seeing dot get ignore. So see, <laughs> sorry, ignore. And up to backslash n. So that clears it up and comes down, right? But I, but I want to keep doing this if, if they make a mistake, I want to fix that mistake, right? I, I need to, okay, so in here, I'm going to say uh, boolean done is equal to false. And in here, I'm going to say while not done or do, because I have to do it first time, right? In here, I'm going to say while not done, then do that. So in here, I'm going to say done is false. And in here, I'm going to say done is true, right? Again. Not the best code, we're going to fix it. That's how you code. You write the code, you go back, you take a look at it, see if it's good or not. This has lots of bugs, awful. It's not going to work, actually. But anyways, so, so I am getting the thing. If, it did, if, it's, if it's a failure, I'm going to clear and ignore. If it's not, then I'm going to come down, right? So, so how do I want it to get? I want to get it as a whole. So if somebody says 10 and puts lots of garbage afterwards, am I okay with that? Or what do I do? So it's better not to do this. So if it actually fails like this, it's going to say ignore and comes out. I know right off bat they did something wrong, right? We know that, right? But then it, down here I'm going to say, wait a minute. If that's the case, I'm going to say if cn.get, cn.get, what does it do? One integer, one character it receives, right? 
if it's not equal to backslash n, it means they added something after the integer, correct? Some garbage is coming after. I, so I do the git ignore over here, not there. So, and I'm going to put this one in the else. So, let's see what happens. So, if it, if it actually, if it actually fails, it's going to clear it, right? And nothing comes out, so we are, in, we are doomed. It's going to go back up. Didn't clean anything. So, I'm going to remove this one and put it over here. Good. So now, if it fails, it clears it and ignores everything up to backslash n. We're okay, right? And in here, if, if it doesn't fail, it comes in here. I'm going to check. Is the other one backslash n? If it's not equal to backslash n, done is false. I shouldn't, I shouldn't keep going. They still did something wrong, right? That's a new version of false. Else, okay, and in here I'm going to say true, right? But if it's false, if it's not equal to backslash, and then I have to say over here, see out only an integer, please. Retry. Right? So, and if it fails over here and I clear it, I'm going to say see out. What do I say over here? I'm going to say invalid integer. Retry. Correct? So now let's see what happens. This ignore over here is bothering me. Okay? So if it fails, it's going to clear it. I have garbage in there, right? It comes out, comes over here, ignores. We are good, right? If it doesn't fail, comes over here. If it's not equal to backslash n, it's got to say something is there. Because it's not backslash n, it means there is garbage. Then it comes over here and clears it, and it's good, right? In here, it says, but if it doesn't fail, it comes over here. It is backslash n. Done is true, correct? Because done is true, I don't need to ignore anymore. So I have to say over here, if not done, ignore, correct? I think that's going to work. So walk through everything. It makes it false, comes over here, reads the value. Let's, three different scenarios. Number one, right off bat, everything is wrong, right? That's false. It comes over here, clears it, prints a message, comes down over here. Done is false, not false is true, ignores everything, goes back up. Number two, they enter something. It doesn't fail, but they put garbage after. So it comes over here, reads one character, and it's not backslash n. Again, done is false, right? Which is redundant. It was false already up there, so I need to remove it. And it's going to say, only an integer, please. Retry. It comes over here. Done is false. Ignores the garbage, and everything goes back up and gets it, right? Three, everything's perfect. Only one integer comes over here, reads it, perfect. Comes over here, reads one, it is integer. Comes over here, makes done. Comes over here, ignore will not happen. Comes out and I have a value. So I just wrote a get int that looks okay to me. Do I need to implement the other one now? No, not yet. Just want to try this one. I'm going to go in that PRG thingy of mine. Just a second. This is the important part. So in here, I'm going to say b dash student main dot cpp. That's the main we, we wrote for the other one. Now let's come back over here. How do I make this thing available in here? I have to instantiate utils to have it over here, right? And obviously, I have to make this public. I don't have any properties. No, no properties are needed in here. Or, do we understand? I have to instantiate utils. That's awful. I don't want to keep instantiating utils. Utils is something like C out. I want to have an instance of it available if I include it. 
That's it. You follow what I'm saying? I don't want to keep, you don't want to keep creating a O stream whenever you want to print something. You have a C out when you, have a, when you include the thing. How do I do that? Easy. I instantiate the utils in the CPP file itself. So in here, in here I'm going to call it utils, let's call it U, capital U. So capital U for me is like C out, correct? Are we okay with this? Problem is that this utils, is on, this utils U is only available in file utils.cpp, correct? Correct? If you have a function, forget about C++, let's go back to C. When we had a function inside a file, we want to make that function available in other files. What did we do? We had a header file. What did we put, what did we put in a header file? Prototype of a function, correct? We can actually put a prototype for a variable to make it available everywhere if it's a file scope variable. So this is a file scope variable, not a global variable. This is file scope. Now, if I want to make this file scope variable global, I'll go to the header file in here, right at the bottom in here. I'm going to say, I have a utils, utils u extern. That becomes a prototype for you in utils.cpp. Therefore, that you that you becomes available any place you include utils.h. Got it? So in IO in, in IO stream, they actually have extern O stream C out. Extern I stream C in. So you can use it everywhere. So that U is instantiated in here. And I'm using it there. Nice. Let's see what I can do. So I'm going to come now in here. I'm, I'm going to say include. I don't need any. I don't need those things. Um, I don't need a student. So in here, I'm just going to say include. I see people are talking. Don't do that, please. <clears throat> don't do that. OK. Utils.h. OK. Now in here, I can say int num. And I'm going to say num, ah, num is equal to u dot get int. Right? Because utils has the extern, I have access to it. So all the functions that you have, and you want to use it from project to project to workshop to whatever, put it in your utils, create functions like this. And if you look at the workshops, every workshop that you say, if you have custom files, you can submit your util files like this. It shows you at your but You can actually add this to your project. So you don't have to redo this stuff over or copy and paste your functions from one place to another. You can just, it's like a plumber taking a toolbox with them. It becomes your toolbox. You can take it with you. So now in here, I'm going to say C out num just to see if it works or not. All right, run it. OK, I didn't put any message for it. Who cares? It's just getting it, right? So I'll do this. Embedded entry retry. OK, I'm going to put uh, one, two, three, and something after. Only an integer. Retry. Now I'm going to put over one, two, three, hit enter. I get one, two, three. So now I have a foolproof entry. Let's use that one to actually write something that is more flexible for me. So in here, I want to get a prompt, right? I'm going to put the prompt at the end. I'll tell you why. So I'll take this prompt. Instead of putting it at the beginning, I'm going to put it, in, put it at the end. Why? Because I know I can ignore arguments from end with default values. OK? Because of that, then it's as if I'm writing two functions. Maybe only you want max and min. So in here, constant character pointer prompt, prompt. And I'm going to set it to null PTR. So if they don't provide it, that pointer is going to be pointing to null, correct? 
We good? So in here, all I need to say is if prompt exists, first print it. Right? If it doesn't exist, don't show anything. Are we okay with this? Now in here, I'm going to say again the same thing. I'm going to say uh, do value set to uh, get int. And in here, I'm going to say while value is less than min, min, or value is greater than max. Correct? Right? So if that happens, it's going to go back and get the value again. I just need an error message. Correct? Now, first I'm going to do it kindergarten way, then I'm going to do it professional way. So the first thing is kindergarten is just copy this value, and I'm going to say if it's going to get repeated, so I'm going to say if over here, I'm going to say, uh, what am I going to say? I'm going to say a C out. Um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a tag over here. I'm going to say min. So it's going to print min. Uh, and I'm going to say greater than equal. So it's going to show the minimum value and then max. And like that, what did I do? And then max like that. And I'm going to say retry. OK? So it shows what this is the minimum, this is the maximum. This is the minimum, maximum, and then retry. Right? Now I come over here, I can do this. I can say, see out. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to say num, so we tested that. We don't need to do it anymore. So I'm going to comment that. Now in here, I'm going to say num is set to uh, get int. And in here, I'm going to say, say, uh, 18 and 100. And in here, I'm going to say, uh, enter, uh, I'm going to say over here, h. Something like that. Are we okay? Why are we getting error? Oh, you, of course. Thank you. You dot get int. There you go. And see how no. Right? I run the program. It's gonna tell me age. If I do like this, it's get int working. Okay? If I put over here 45 years old, it's get int working. If I say one, two, three, now it's the other one working. Now it's actually my function get int working. Now if I say 55, everything's good. You follow? Okay, now, what else? What else uh, I want to, oh, that, that was the kindergarten way. What is the non-kindergarten way? What is lazy evaluation, IPC 144? Lazy evaluation. Hmm? Who the what? Flag. Flag. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but what is lazy evaluation? Anybody knows what is lazy evaluation? Not, <laughs> oh, you said lazy like, no. A lazy evaluation means C plus C language is, is lazy. If it comes to a conclusion of a logical operator, it's not going to check the rest. Remember that, right? We talked about it. So, and I think I, was it here that I drew the thing, the circuits with the lamp and stuff? I didn't do that. Um, do I have a marker? I don't think I do have a marker. Oh, I do have a marker. Perfect, fantastic. And I do have a marker. Let me see if I have. Uh, oh, can I bring it here? Yes. Good. So, so this is, I want to know where I can write. <laughs> OK, so take a look at this. So this is a bad marker. 
Uh, I have more. I have more. Okay, so this is a bat. This is a, a circuit. So this is a lamp. Go like that. Comes over here, and this is a battery. And in here, I have two keys standing like this. Okay, for the light to go on, what should happen with those keys? They both should be closed, right? It is impossible for it to work if one of it is open. Now, if the first one is open, do you care if the second one is closed or not? No, because it's closed. It's, it's, it is open. It won't happen. Nothing happens. That's lazy evaluation. So if you say condition and something, this is, by the way, and. This is an and. OK? So in your condition, if the first condition is false and anything else, it doesn't care. It's not going to check it. Same thing happens with or. What is or? Or is the exact same thing, but it's like this. For this thing to go on, only one of them should be on. Right? Now, if this one is on, do you care if the second one is on or not? No. So for or, lazy evaluation happens for truth. If the first one is true or anything, then it's all true. Are we okay with this? Thank you. You see this C out? You see that C out? Look at this. I'm gonna remove, I'm gonna remove this completely and say. And see out. What's going to happen now? If the condition is true, it means while loop must repeat, correct? True and it has to check the other one to see if it's true or false. So see out will be printed. Therefore, message will be printed. Goes up, comes out, the condition is false, which means it is falling between the two things and we want to get out. All right? False and, see how it will never happen. I don't need to write an if statement. Quick and easy. Lazy evaluation comes very handy. OK? So now if I actually run this code, it works the exact same way. Nobody knows the difference. And actually, when you, when you look at, uh, like if you see people coding, if statements, like, if, like somebody who writes games, when they write a small if statement like this, in here I'm saying, if not done, see in, right? Correct? So if it is not done is true, I can actually do this. I don't need to write an if statement. Right? It has no purpose, but it's, but, Computer is stupid. When you write an and, it checks the first one. Is the first one true? I have to check the second one. It ignores. Now in here, I'm going to say, but something that is important is that the second one must be able to be evaluated to a Boolean. And seeing will. You know that seeing is, it checks to see if it's successful or not. But who cares? That's not what I want. I want the ignore to happen. The same thing for see out. I don't care. As long as it's evaluated, that's what's important. So this is just a faster if statement. Those people who write, because there is no jump, there is nothing. It's just evaluation, right? So I'm not going to. So these are fun part of programming. Like when you, when you write like this, it's just more fun, OK? I know I'm a nerd, but hey. OK, so it's the uh, same thing. It works the same way. Let's see if it works. Sometimes it, like I'm, I do something and if and that. So embedded, uh, yada, yada, yada. I think I'm going with one, two, three. There you go. Now it's going to say retry. So that's the thing happening. If I go, uh, if I go 29, uh, 29 comes through. So that's good. So now we have ourselves a foolproof get int. I expect you guys to all have this. Now, if I were you, I would make this error message I would make this error message custom, which means put an error message over here and set it to null PTR. 
if it is null, print your own error message. If not, print that one. So it becomes more flexible. Maybe you want to show another type of message over there. So anyways, are we good? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right, done.